Yes, that's what I'm going to say. Hey, live, you're live on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy and those who have no clue. I'm Teddy. And the dude in the, the lovely pink shirt with the shiny cap on his head is my, uh, my, hey, look, I'll use this one now, this one, Randy, my, uh, my partner in crime, Mr. Randy Wooden. And, uh, and with that little satire, I'll let you know that our <laughs> special guest today is Chief of Police from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, William Penn. And um, this is uh, our first show in July. We are sponsorless. Uh, mm. And uh, so that gives us a little bit more freedom to do whatever the heck we want to do until we find a sponsor, which we need to find a sponsor because without a sponsor, the show will start to degrade and we don't want that happening for you. But anyway, all that being said, Randy, you doing all right? Yeah, so far so good. I'm working on uh, getting well, us up on LinkedIn. I'll let too. you finish that up while I let everybody yeah. know that I, I work for this lady named uh, Mrs. Burris. That would be my wife of 45 years. And our company is Burris Consulting. We're social media strategists focused on using LinkedIn as a business tool. I was really pleased to see uh, Chief of Police William Penn on LinkedIn, no less. Like, damn, representing. Uh, but we help business professionals who want to use LinkedIn as a business tool. And uh, we do webinars and seminars and keynote speeches, workshops. And as some of you know, I will stand on a street corner and prostatize the, I think that's the right word, the power of using LinkedIn as a business tool. Randy, you got your ducks in a row? Yeah, I think we're pretty well there by now. So let me click that clicker. And uh, yeah, Randy Wooden with Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. Director for our professional center. It's based in Winston. A lot of folks don't necessarily know that our goodwill in, in Winston has a professional center. And, and so if you or maybe you know somebody who's degreed or maybe in a leadership role, maybe you owned a small business, or maybe who has the, the want to and needs some of the how-to to up their professional career a bit to move into that, uh, I guess what I would call professional ranks reach out to me. We're free. There's no cost. We'll get you on the calendar and try to get you squared away and get you some help to get where you want to go. But I'll tell you what, every Wednesday we get together. It's been going on with show number 170. Are we there or 169? It's 169, man. 100, yeah, 169 weeks. I've been putting up with you and vice versa. So um, I guess we made it past the newlywed stage, Teddy. So longer than most we'll marriages. Use a different last. analogy next time, Randy. Okay, we'll do. But been doing it for a long time, and we get together every Wednesday, have a good time. We learn stuff. Uh, first time we've had, I believe, anyone from law enforcement on. Uh, Chief William Penn, who is, I, I'm going to say, recently uh, been promoted. Uh, recent is a relative term, especially as I get older. You know, ten years ago is recent, but recently promoted to uh, police chief, Winston Salem Police Department. So we're going to talk to. Chief Penn, a little bit more about uh, his life uh, leading up to where he is today, some of his hobbies, passions, and what motivates him. But also there's some stuff going on, and you know, you don't have to be blind. You, you look in the paper, you see online and whatnot. A lot of challenges across the country, not just here in Winston, but uh, the challenges that all police departments face, but specifically some here in the triad in Winston, some accomplishments, some things that are going on, how uh, law enforcement has changed over the years. And, and also, if you've got comments or questions for Will, please put them in the chat area. Teddy will be uh, keeping an eye on that and work those in where appropriate. But Will, I, you know, I've just kind of glossed over your, your bio real briefly, but if you would introduce yourself a little bit more detail, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. I'm pleased to be here. I um, especially like the fact I'm the first law enforcement official here. So um, kudos for that. <laughs> and one of the things I pride myself on, I am from Winston-Salem. Mm -hmm. So Born and raised um, on the east side of Winston-Salem, actually born in a place called New Bethel Apartments. Mm -hmm. And um, now that's uh, it's called Rolling Hills Apartments. You, you heard about that, about that area. I graduated from Carver High School. Um, then I went to college at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. My, my brother-in-law had got me a job working security on the weekends at Forsyth Hospital. Um, so on the weekends, I would come to Forsyth Hospital and I would work security, security guard walking around. And I got to meet some Winston-Salem Police Department um, officers and just really, really was proud, was really just, I don't know the word for it, but um, 
they impressed me a lot. Yeah. And so I started thinking about a, going to work for the police department, but I had no, had no intention of making it a career. Mm-hmm. So um, I graduated from college. I joined the force. And I said, I'll do this for a couple of years and see where it takes me. So about after five years, I said, okay, let me go try something different. And the economy tanked. So I said, I better stay here where a uh, stable and um, job security. So mm-hmm. in the meantime, I said, let me go back to school so that when the economy turns around, I'll, I'll, I'll have a master's degree and I'll really go somewhere and make some money. Um, so I went back to college and yeah. got a master's degree. And then after that, it, the economy tanked again. And then if, at some point I said, well, let me just see how this is going. Because in the meantime, yeah. I'm, I'm actually getting promoted. I'm being transferred. I, I'm doing some really cool things. And finally, it got through my thick skull that maybe God had a plan for me. Yeah. And maybe I ought to stick with what I'm doing. And and then, of course, 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> so so it sounds I always ask the why question. Uh, people are passionate about what they do. And it sounds like at least initially is kind of like, eh, you know, we'll try it out. Was there a point at which you said, I really dig this stuff? I mean, I can make it. Di- I don't know what it was. Was there a single instance or was it just a culmination of things? Right. So I, I would love to tell you that it was a bank robber I called or a hostage I saved. Uh, however, that that's not the case. My my aha moment. Mm -hmm. was simply going to a call between where it was an argument between mother and son. Um, Mother felt like um, son wasn't acting like an adult, even though he was. Son thought mom wasn't treating like an adult. Um, This call could have taken about five minutes where I asked him to go to different sides of the room and and, uh, take a time out. However, I stayed there. We talked. We came up with strategies. I left the call thinking nothing had happened. A couple of years later, I'm going through a drive through and a guy says, hey, Officer Penn. And I had no clue of who it was, but it was the son. He was he was working at, at an Arby's and he told me that he was getting ready to start in fire school. And he wanted to thank me because me refereeing that day, he and his mother um, came to came on good terms. Things have been great and um, couldn't happen without me. But they did the work. But it it just let me know that you never know the impact you have on on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And that that was my aha moment. Cool. It was. Yeah, Teddy? Yeah, William, when you said you uh, worked as a security guard at one of the hospitals in town before you went to and joined the the Mm -hmm. police department, is that what I heard? Yes. Yes. Do you mind sharing what was the company you worked for as a security guard? Right. It was Scythe Hospital. And that, it that's, was the it hospitals. Was called, yeah, in, it was for Scythe Hospital before and when it was called for Scythe Hospital. Okay, yeah, so it was yeah. in-house security. It was in-house security, yes. Gotcha, gotcha. Teddy, because gotcha. you used to work for a company that had part of it was yeah, yeah, but security. We, yeah, we, we, but I quit there because it was we didn't have guns. I'm joking. Now, it was, I worked for a company that did uh, the Bud Group. <clears throat> okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, they no longer do security, but that that was uh, I love the security division of the bug group. Those people cared about people. Yeah, that's what it was all about. Yeah, I had a blast there and and just seeing the officers take care of all of us. um, I I, I just had an affinity for them Mm -hmm. and and just an appreciation that that's carried me on to, to today. Cool. Yeah. There were, uh, you know, as we do each each week with each guest, we kind of review <clears throat> some talking points, some things you, you want to bring up. And it was something that uh, you had included in there that I, I thought was pretty important. And we can talk about, uh, you know, police can't be everywhere. Right. And, and I think we all realize that. that the, and whether it's budgets, just geography, I mean, just to get issues. They can't make it happen for everybody everywhere. You talked about personal accountability and the solid family foundation as a couple of key elements uh, aside or complementary um, to policing. Could you talk a little bit more about the value of that, the importance of those two things? Right. So, so the personal accountability is, is the essence of law enforcement because so much of what we do is predicated on trust of the community. Um, when you when you go out as a law enforcement official, you want and need people calling. 
and people stop calling when they lose trust in you. So as long as people are calling, we know that we're we're halfway doing what we're supposed to do because there's always room to get better. So so what I would tell you that personal accountability is a essence of a free society. Um, we we enjoy the freedoms of this country. However, there has to be personal accountability so that my freedoms don't infringe upon the rights uh, of others. And then I, I talked a lot about solid family foundation. When, when you talk to people in the community about what the problem is, and I love hearing them talk about what the issues are, mm -hmm. they will tell you the family foundation, a degradation of the family foundation. And I don't disagree with that. Um, it, is, it is important that we lay down a foundation for our children um, so that we we don't raise broken children because broken children become broken adults. Mm -hmm. One of the things I said in my swearing in is at every level, whether it was at home, whether it was at school, in the community, I was always told that I could be, that I could, I could, I could. And so many folks in our community aren't hearing yeah. that. And that's the, at the essence of my foundation. Yeah. The uh, and. And I also too wonder, you know, it's family. You hear the old thing about, hey, it takes a village, and and you know, it's certainly a degree of truth to that. I guess a, a question might be the level of police involvement. I mean, in a, in the one hand, I think, hey, you're out chasing bad guys. You don't have time to be proactive. But I'm sure that you do uh, coffee with a cop. You get to meet people. You you know, you put a face instead of it just being police enforcement. Now I get to know this guy. I get to talk to that lady. You see that kind of thing. So help us understand how the police department is is moving forward and trying to address some of those issues about accountability and and that core family value stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah. you know, if you think about law enforcement 20, 30 years ago, it was a just the facts, sir. Just the facts, ma'am. Um, yep. Pretty black and white. Pretty rigid. You 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 break the law. You, you write the ticket or, or, or take them to jail. And as time has gone by, people expect more from their law enforcement officials. Now, when we start talking about what makes a police department legitimate, it's the people. So anytime you see a riot, what you're seeing is the community is saying, we no longer recognize your ability to police us because you've lost that trust. So when I talk about legitimacy, it means that the, the community believes that the actions we're taking are for the benefit of the citizens. So again, uh, simply going to a poor neighborhood and writing tickets for the sake of writing tickets and, um, and for folks who can't afford the ticket. Mm -hmm. When you're done with those actions, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, did my actions help that community? my community. Um, if it doesn't, if it was just about writing tickets, then that's how you lose legitimacy. So we have to measure ourselves based on what the community thinks of what we do and how we do it. And, and, right. and 30, 40 years ago, that was, people didn't question that the transparency wasn't there and people just didn't, they didn't fight what the police were doing. Now, now we have to answer questions. Well, yeah, everybody's got a cell phone. Everyone has a cell you know? phone. Yeah. And uh, by the way, Teddy, I, you know, I'm not a big movie guy, right? And you know, because we've had this conversation, but I just saw that. Uh, was it called A Man Called Otto? Oh, yeah. uh, the Tom Hanks movie. Yep. And without well, giving a whole story thing away, but a guy was uh, a guy fell off uh, uh, the 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 railroad tracks onto the tracks, and. Uh, Tom Hanks got down to try to help the guy. He was the only one. Everybody else got their cell phone out filming this guy who's about to get run over by a train. It, it literally. And, and it just it, it, it struck me because, you know, we always hear that. But it was in a movie and it was just like, come on, guys. Uh, but, it, but everybody's got a, a camera these days. And um, I guess, too, don't most officers have one, hopefully. So, right. You, Right. Mm -hmm. now, and I'll tell you, we were one yeah. of the first agencies to, to go to the body worn camera. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had body worn cameras almost 10 years now. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's required for us to turn on when we're dealing with the with the community. So um, the folks who in our agency, they've been raised on the body worn camera. And 
and trying to navigate their way through that for 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 a long time. So we're proud of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's part of Teddy. You said something you wanted to work well, in. There? I got a question that came right. up. I want to see if it uh, if this if this question makes sense to talk about. <clears throat> Gene wants to know: Does the uh, Winston Salem uh, Police Department follow a community policing model, or is that outdated? No, 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 no. We, we've we been a community-oriented police department since 1989. Uh, Chief Sweat at the time um, mm -hmm. took us in that direction. And what we prided ourselves on is taking it to the next level. So there are all these fancy definitions of community-oriented policing, but, but it boils down to this, having a relationship outside of law enforcement actions with your community and to such a degree that you fix problems together. Yeah. Now, I would tell you that, and I said since 1989, but what I want to tell you, and we'll, I know we'll mm -hmm. touch on this, but during the uprisings during George Floyd, after George Floyd's murder, almost every agency in North Carolina, with the exception of the Winston-Salem Police Department, had violence and had destruction. Not one window was broken. Um, none of that occurred in Winston-Salem. And the reason that occurred, I believe, is that it was our leadership in community-oriented policing. We established those relationships. Um, folks knew who we were. You can't establish relationships with your community during chaos. It has to be done on the forefront. That's where you establish the trust. That's where you understand one another. Even when you disagree, you have a basic understanding of how and why things are being done. And I think that went a long way towards the peace in Winston-Salem during those times. Yeah. I get, Randy, what thought, I mean, yeah. William, what I just heard is life is better for everybody if the engagements are not always if there are minor, if the minority of the engagements are defensive and offensive, if their relationship engagements more so than anything else, that's why that's, that happened in Winston after the murder of, of George Floyd. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been in community meetings where we just have fundamental differences. I will tell you, we have some communities I go to and the folks think you should arrest everybody. <laughs> and I've been in what it said, you shouldn't be arresting anyone, right? And we can have those conversations and we can disagree. But if they believe that, again, going back to the legitimacy of an organization, of a law enforcement organization, if they believe that even though you disagree with the how, that we agree with the why we're doing what we're doing, we can almost get past anything. Yeah, cool. And I'll, I'll bridge this over to, corporate America too. And I think we've all had bosses that the only time we hear from is when they're pissed off at you, right. you know, <clears throat> and, right. and so it's like, oh boy, there they come again. And you know, you're just going to get hammered. And, and, and so the rapport isn't there. Right. And same thing with what you do only, you know, nobody dies at work, right. but you know, you can die on the streets, so, I guess. So this, this transcends law enforcement, it's relationship building, and then when you do have to have those difficult discussions, you've got at least some, I guess, common ground or mutual respect uh, <laughs> and working toward the goal. But uh, very interesting, it, it, that shift. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is how policing has changed from the days of Dragnet. <laughs> Teddy, Teddy's old. He remembers that show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Friday and all that. And uh, so, yeah, the technology, I mean, we can dive, you know, you can spend five hours talking technology, but let's walk through some of the ways that, that policing has changed and to include technology, take it wherever you want to go. All right. So, so first yeah. thing I'll point out is that, is that I'm sitting here with a beer and um, that was a no, no in law enforcement before. So, so when you start talking about all the differences, um, they, they come from somewhere, right? We'll touch on the great resignation where, but 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 just, no, let's start with the great resignation. Yeah. Uh, employees just have a lot more say um, than they had than they have in the past. So um, we, we've been late to the party on a lot of it, but what you'll see is law enforcement trying to catch up with, with, with some of the things that probably been going on for a while in the corporate land. So 
where we can, we have employees that can work from home. We try to do that. Mm -hmm. We try to be flexible with, with schedules as we can, and not necessarily for the patrol officers, but but for our other employees. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge way in law enforcement has changed. You see officers with tattoos. Those were no goes back in the day. So we just had to catch up with time. Talk about technology. When I, when I started here, I was writing reports. So um, I was getting yelled at all the time about my terrible handwriting. Um, that's no that's no longer an issue. You know, officers are are now typing reports, and um, that may sound like you know something small, but but being able to type out a report from your car and then have it magically uh, go to records and becomes a uh, or part of records it, it is a big deal. Now, I pointed out earlier, mm -hmm. the community just expects more from us. And, and so what it was, was we, we show up on the scene and either somebody went to jail or or not. Now we're, we're working with folks, the, the homeless community. Now we're dealing with mental health. It's just more expected from us. So it forces us to deal with some of the some of the social issues in the community that haven't been addressed, there's no one that address it but the police department. So if the tech and also the technology is cameras. And you're gonna hear me talk a lot about cameras. The mm -hmm. funny, the funny yeah. thing about it is sometimes when I'm talking to people about camera, they say, oh my gosh, my privacy. However, <laughs> you know, if you say something on your phone, you're looking for a truck, you'll see it show up on all your social media. We've been going walking into Walmart, looking right up at a camera, making sure that we look okay. Um, we, we, we've been uh, utilizing technology, the, the license plate readers in downtown when you park. Those are things that have been going on for, for quite a while now, mm -hmm. uh, but now we need it in law enforcement. You gotta have yeah. it. Yeah, and I was gonna ask you about the uh, the camera. In fact, I wrote it down about the speed cameras, but also I think, was it, Oh gosh, I don't know if it was uh, Sheriff Kimbrough or or somebody talking about. Um, uh, I guess when a, when a gun is fired, there are receptors that can pinpoint where the gun was fired from, or something to help direct officers. Help help us understand what that's about. Right, right. So it's yeah. shot spotter technology. Yeah, and what it does is is a triangulation um, using acoustics to pinpoint where a gun was fired. Now, this technology is able to make the difference, um, understand the differences between a fireworks and shots. So what it, that information comes directly to communication. So normally shots are fired. Um, somebody calls communications. They say, hey, I just heard gunfire. And then the communications operator has to get a lot of information from them quickly to, to give it out to the officer. That with shot spotter technology, it immediately comes to us with coordinates of where those shots were fired. Mm. When the company came and presented before us, they let us know that 80% of gunshot, gunshots in this city is not reported. And we didn't believe that not one bit. And it turns out that is the case. Mm. On one occasion, uh, that we got the shot spotter alert, officers went to a location found a man um, who had been shot in the leg, was bleeding out, we were able to get him assistance. Might have been the only time in a long time that somebody didn't have a cell phone on. He didn't have a cell phone. Wow. He wasn't able to call. Shot spotter absolutely saved his life. Yeah. Wow. And and I also reading too, somewhere again, I don't know where, it's online, so I know it's true, right? So, um, <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> where where law enforcement is partnering, uh, and I guess there's some legal issues with this from a privacy standpoint, um, to try to pinpoint who a suspect might be based on their uh, their cell phone data and and where they were. Um, can you talk us through some of the the issues with that? Well, I'd probably rather not. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, 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 don't I, go there. I don't want to. I don't want to divulge any secrets and get yeah. somebody hurt. But, but yeah, there can be technology yeah. wherever we can legally yeah. um, to to help with to help with solving crime. Yeah, yeah. It, and uh, you know, as the crooks get smarter, you guys have to keep up with that stuff. Same thing with technology. Uh, you know, cybersecurity and just. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of bad stuff going on there. Um, yeah, a lot of people like yeah. to wrangle, like to 
complain about about the budgets of the police department. Yeah. And, and you you touched on that. Not only do we need technology um, for the prevention and for the apprehension, but but for for prosecution, is it, it, is no it, it does us no good to arrest someone and then we can't prosecute because they're using more technology mm -hmm. more, more software than the police department we have to be able to match that to get people off the streets and i'll tell you so much crime now is being planned and implemented using technology yeah mm -hmm. yeah i get it yeah um, hey yep. what you got? um William Jean, uh, Jean's a former officer, and uh, he said that one of the things, and I, I'm sure that the West Salem Police Department does something similar. He said he used to walk his beat at night with his lieutenant and zone partners, and that made a huge difference in the the relationship between the officers and the community. So kudos right, for right. Gene. Gene right. hadn't told us where he was a police officer yet, so I'm, I'm not sure. We'll find that out. Yeah. Possibly, so. do, you, do you find that there are, um, I'll call them hot spots um, within town where, I mean, you've got to find out, and you're, you're dealing with the great resignation too. I mean, I'm sure you're understaffed like everybody else is, and you've got a finite number of bodies to put out on patrol. Uh, are there certain metrics that you use or how do you determine where to allocate your resources, people-wise and technology? Right, right. Yeah. You, you mentioned hot spots, but there, there's a term hot spots policing. That, yeah. that is a strategy for, for crimes, and, that, and that's where you, you send um, the bodies where the crime is happening. Um, and it's it's kind of straightforward, isn't it? However, you, you have to be careful that you don't over police a community. Uh, over time, so traditionally what we would do is, mm -hmm. hey, that's an area where we're getting a lot of calls. We'll take a zero tolerance approach, go in, we arrest and, and, and write tickets for everything. And we'd walk out and we've arrested a bunch of people, but we've also alienated that community. So we have to become a smarter agency. So you all know and have heard time and time again that it's just a few people committing the violent acts. And so utilizing the technology, the, whether it's license plate readers, whether it's um, the cameras, whether it's any type of a uh, tracking device so that we pinpoint and get those people off the street so that we're not beaten up on a whole community just because there's a few people in there causing a bunch of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you find that uh, from a, I'll call it a, either a, a gender or a race, um, that it's important or the, or talk to the importance of the police department, the, the visual component uh, mirroring the community that they're serving? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so when you look at a police department, yeah, you want to see that it represents the community. You, you people uh, are conscious of self. And yeah. there are times when you roll up on, on the scene and people just gravitate to someone who looks like them, yeah. who maybe speaks like them. And it's important. That's where the, it goes back to what I said with trust. Uh, and if that makes that person feel more comfortable, um, then that's what we do. And, and they should see that in the police department. Yeah. Gotcha. Teddy, we're about halfway through. You want to take a quick... Uh, yeah, yeah. So... Um, you're on Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. Those that don't know, I'm Randy. My cohort here in pink is, uh, I'm, I'm Teddy. My cohort is Randy. Our special guest today is Winston-Salem Chief of Police William Penn. Uh, I've, uh, I've been uh, lobbying him for a get out of free jail card, and he says, Teddy, we'll talk about it. He's made no promises. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, open conversation, really, to yeah. get to get to learn who uh, William Penn is. And uh, and and dig a little bit more into you know what the Winston Salem Police Department is all about, how it's grown and changing, and uh, we yeah. appreciate all of our guests. Yeah, excuse me, all of our attendees. Randy, we have twenty two thousand people in the audience today. Wow, do they you have know, to scrunch them in a little bit like this to fit? Yeah, everybody? I get yeah, a few people sitting on kneecaps and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, back to you, buddy. 
Yeah. Hey, before I forget, uh, Catherine with Leadership Winston actually introduced us by email, but I, I remember seeing you. I was a leadership class of 2022. I've already forgotten. I, we were the most, I don't want to say flexible, diverse. Uh, anyway, because we went back and forth between, right. you know, virtual and uh, um, what uh, you were in leadership too. When was that? Yes, I was class of yeah. 2020 and we were the most visionary. Visionary. Class you're, ever. Yeah. So you're we, f- we talked a lot about vision. Well, you, you're also the first one to take a dip in the uh, the virtual pool too, I think, we, right? We COVID. did. We did. We started off um, together yeah. in COVID and, and we, we made adjustments. And so, yeah, we were the first class that, that did the hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good times. Good experience. So, um, yeah, it seems like yesterday they've already graduated another class. So yeah, yeah. on we go. Uh, all right. So we've talked a little bit about how policing has changed. Uh, I'm hearing things like building relationships, getting into the community, establishing rapport and trust versus waiting until bad things happen and then trying to band-aid it. It doesn't work that way. You need to right. be proactive. And I'm hearing that. Um, and I'm assuming that that's the case across the country, right. you know, in all cities of any size. And and one th- I tell you, one thing I remembered, we talked this before we went live today, was I remembered a couple of things. We had a coffee with a cop as part of leadership, uh, Winston, one day. And a, a couple of things that a couple, three things stood out. One was that, uh, you know, you think Winston-Salem's a sleepy town kind of deal. And, you know, we're not New York City. We're not Chicago. We're not Detroit. We're not whatever. And but you know what? The same crap happens here as it does there. Right. Um, that's one thing. Another was um, I forget the others, but no, the other one dealt with uh, it is about relationship right. and and getting the face time with somebody to see that they are a real person behind that badge. They they really care. They have a family. They go to church with us. They work in our community, and that, that they have kids that play ball with our kids, that kind of thing. And and there there was another one, and I. I forget what the third one. I really do forget the third one, but um, you, oh yeah, cops can't be everywhere. Right. And that goes back to the relationship. So speak to this whole thing about, you know, it's not just us in Winston. How, how did, how did they figure that stuff out? I mean, we're just a tiny town compared to these big cities. How right. are we so, so we say, we say that Winston Salem is a small city, but it's the 92nd largest city in America. So it's in the mm-hmm. top 100 in, in size. So Across the nation, most agencies are anywhere from 10 to 20 offices. So nationally, we're a large city. We're a large agency and, and not a small. So now we're not as large as L.A. and New York, but, but you know, I will tell you poverty. I will tell you uh, lack of access to mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, to connectivity. We talked about the degradation of of the family structure. Yeah, That travels. And and when you're dealing with with that kind of distress in in any community, I don't care how large or small it is, what's born of that is is Mm -hmm. normally crime. And and so Winston-Salem has all of the above. Mm -hmm. and, And we have to come to grips with that. And we have to do something about that because again, that's what breeds the crime. And as an agency now, I think all law enforcement agencies have to look at that. It's no longer, we don't worry about that piece. We just worry about the enforcement part. We're just not in a position where we can do that now because we can't arrest ourselves out of these problems. Yeah. Yeah. COVID's changed a whole lot. How's that changed policing? Oh, well, <laughs> it's changed it in a variety of ways. Uh, yeah. Again, and one of the things, um, what COVID, COVID didn't cause inequities in the community. What it did was it, it exposed it. Mm-hmm. So a couple of things that we started, had, we needed to mm-hmm. use technology with, with COVID. We couldn't come together. Um, a lot of times it, it changed enforcement. How often during COVID, how often did we want our officers stopping people, peering into the, the car and, and asking questions? Um, so it, it changed how we did that. It changed, um, you know, as far as, you know, the the vaccinations, individual rights, so that, that became a, a big deal, mm-hmm. um, not only just in the community, but those things, the police department is just a microcosm of the community. 
So the problems that are happening yeah. in the community are happening with, with the, within the police department. So all of those things, the, the great resignation, um, staffing shortages, we, we had people get sick. We, we lost an officer um, to COVID. So, so yeah, it, it changed a, a lot about, about how we do business. And, and probably haven't fully recovered from that yet. Yeah. Yeah. And on the, on the plus side, you've become more comfortable with whether it's Zoom or other uh, remote ways. Right. And, and so that's that's been a plus. And, and you've also shown to be resilient. Right. You didn't just crawl up in a corner and just let, say, oh, I'm done. Right. So you had you had to make do. You had to figure things out like you know, school teachers and everybody else. Yeah. Teddy, what you got? Go ahead. Brett. Um, I, I got um, I'm bringing another question up from the audience. And D Dale's asking this question, William. Yeah. And, and don't worry about his what's it what's happening in the back of his mind. I'll take care of that. I, but anyway, he wants to know how has cannab uh, uh, cannabis legislation affected your job? So, it, twenty years ago, ten years ago, just the smell of marijuana gave me probable cause to search because basically I had the training experience to tell me that this was marijuana. Now with the CBD, they smell exactly the same. So just me smelling it and being able to go and, and take care of business because that equated to probable cause is no longer the case. Mm, so we have to do a lot more investigative work to get to that point while understanding that it's a misdemeanor. Yeah. And I got people out here shooting people. How much time do I really want to spend towards marijuana, these are the kind of discussions, that's, those are things I have to, as the chief of police, balance out. So it, it, it's, it's been pretty big, it's pretty big. So should I mm -hmm. tell Dale to stay at home no matter what he's doing? You tell Dale that marijuana is still illegal. No, that, <laughs> no matter what, no matter what, it's still illegal. You, you, he heard. He heard you. Okay. <laughs> now, by the way, he did. He did have a little factoid he wants to throw out. Okay. Uh, Dale's um um a re, um retired firefighter, seventeen year firefighter, okay. and he said he noticed that you are wearing your gold eagle insignia instead of the five uh, star cluster. What does that mean to you? So, some of my colleagues uh, across the nation, even even in across the triad, they they wear the stars, and um, I, I like these just fine. Okay. There, there you go, go, Dale. There you go. <laughs> All right, you mentioned George Floyd's murder, and and uh, you know that created obviously you know, a lot of rioting and just a whole host of things going on. But you mentioned also that Winston uh, was able to really avoid. I guess what I call damage, uh, broken windows, cars, that kind of thing. So uh, kudos, kudos to that. Now, let me ask you, how, how has that or has it changed how you police after after that went down? So if, if you will allow me an opportunity to brag on my agency, there was an eight can't wait movement. And it was it was eight demands that that the community were, were making. And, and I don't know all eight of them at the top of my head, but yeah. But what I will tell you is that we were already operating at that. So that we didn't have to. So as far as uh, um, one, one of them was um, make the chokehold illegal, you know, a, a, in the policy. So we, we, we're, we weren't doing any of those things. So um, just to give you an idea about how progressive we are. Remember, I told you before that we we have been using body one camera um, almost 10 years now. So we've been at the forefront of progressive policing so we we were it didn't it didn't take much of course anytime something like that happens mm -hmm. it makes our jobs much more difficult right because um something that an officer is doing in anchorage police department if, if it's ugly and if it shows on the news that that weakens the trust in in the community with the police department and, and our community, um, and we have to constantly overcome that. But as far as what what major changes we had to do because of George Floyd murder, no, nothing. But what I'll also tell you is that we're constantly looking at our processes 
we're constantly looking at our policies to ensure that, that we're utilizing best practices in what we do. Yeah. Hey, that uh, Teddy, that was something Greg had mentioned in the in the chat is when you, when you go and speak to other uh, police chiefs throughout you know, in different conferences or in different states, what are some things you guys talk about? Well, great question. One of the things we talk about is what's going on in our cities mm -hmm. and what we find over and over and over again. It's the same issues. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you're talking, when I'm on a webinar with NYPD commissioner, what are they talking about? They're talking about staffing shortages. Um, they're, they're talking about the, the violence. We're, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about, hey, we arrest a bad person and we get them off the street. And next thing you know, we send them back out um, because the bond, they get out on bond. And so we're starting back over. And these are these are complaints that we have across the nation. And what we learn, what we realize is that we're dealing with the same issues. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much the same. There's something Wait. I was going to follow up on. Oh, you got something, Teddy? No, I'm going to wonder when you when are you going to talk about the staffing because I want to find out how to get a job. <laughs> well, I got to pass a background check, Teddy. Just yeah. saying. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. A just saying, there's that little minor detail I thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, yeah I, I'm glad you brought that up <laughs> because you, you know it's no secret we're, yeah. we're about yeah. 150 officers short, and and I know that 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 can become alarming for folks. Hey, Will, when when you're down 150, what would be your normal full capacity on this? 150 related to what? We're, we're to about 530. So you're at 380 or whatever right now. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. And and, and yeah. I can see where that would absolutely make people. Ooh, yeah, that that that's a lot of people. Yeah. Um. So so we've, you know, we've taken some of our other units and they they've dwindled down so that we can keep people out on patrol. Um, some of the things we're really proud about. Um, so we have a Lexus Nexus program, which is a self-reporting system. So what it allows folks in the community to do, if it's very minor crime where yeah. suspect's not there, it's not violent, uh, maybe somebody stole something, uh, a flamingo out of my yard, you can report that with the self-reporting system, get your report number, get everything you need, and even send video if you have it. And that will allow that report to be documented, but it doesn't take an officer off the street. So keeping the folks that we have on the street for the violence. Also, you might have heard about the BEAR program that the city implemented. And BEAR is an acronym for Behavior Evaluation and Response. This is a group that they work out of the fire department, but they respond to mental health calls. So mm -hmm. they're out, they get to the scene and what they do a couple of things. Number one, they're able to, they're the professionals, they're the experts, they're subject matter experts. So they're able to give that citizen the, the help that they need much more than we can. Mm -hmm. Also, it allows us to bow out and go and deal with the violent crime, which is our priority. Yeah. So that that's a, another resource for us. Um, I also tell you about the city and county have teamed up and the violence interrupters. And those will kick in here soon, but those will be folks in the community. They have the credibility um, in the community. Yeah, and I know Keisha Springs. Um, they have the credibility of the community and what they try to do, they're gonna try to tamp down on the violence and maybe try to help mm -hmm. interrupt that violence before it occurs. So so I, when I tell people we're sure I, I also like to bring that up and let folks understand some of the things that we're doing to deal with those shortages. I also tell you, we've reached out now, we're working with a marketing firm and we're probably one of the few agencies to do that. Traditionally, our recruiting has been a police officer. Hey, now you work in recruiting. I was one of those guys. I worked in recruiting mm -hmm. and it was during a time when the, the, the job recruited itself. We were getting thousands of applicants to come in and want to do this job. So we didn't have to be especially creative. We didn't have to worry about branding. The law enforcement the police officer was the brand itself. That's not the case now. Mm. So we reached out uh, to, we've outsourced that. So we got some thing, good things going. Um, we got a class that's smaller than we, we wanted, but we have a larger 
pool and background now. So the pendulum mm -hmm. may be turning. So we're really excited about that. I don't want to give the community the, the bad news that we're sure without telling them how we're overcoming that and that better days are ahead. Yeah. You know, going back real quick to the after the Floyd murder, I felt bad. You know, it's, it, you saw so many, uh, what did I get? not sabotage, but uh, ambush, mm -hmm. you know, a fake call and they ambush the right. cops. And I mean, you guys are out there trying to keep us safe. Right. Last thing you need are a bunch of, you know, whatever going on like that. Just it was it was bad, bad. All right. So, uh, you know, gangs are everywhere. Talk about defund the police movement. Either. So, um, oh, the, yeah, the defund the police. Defund yeah. the police um, yeah. decimated. It, it decimated law enforcement. It, yeah. it absolutely yeah. did. What we started seeing resignations and when we talked, did the exit interviews, we had officers saying, my family wants me out. Yep. Um, they're, they're hearing people say, take resources from you they don't care about you we care about you get out of the job so we absolutely had officers leaving because of of family pressures yeah i've heard of those yeah. yeah yeah and it's uh yeah this i mean it, it's one of those things it's same with the military i had a son in the military and and the things that i'm sure he witnessed and you know stuff that went on behind the scenes would just just yeah. make you shudder so uh hats off to you guys you know you guys are doing uh fantastic work and so this the gang violence stuff i mean it's everywhere and he, every day you turn around the newspaper somebody got shot maybe they didn't get killed but i mean you got i assume you get a phone call every time right. every time somebody gets shot so i mean do, uh, when do you sleep <laughs> i mean i'm only being ha I'm half serious i mean it's yeah. just yeah. wild out there I, I get asked that all the time i do i get a text yeah. message i get a message um, yeah. a phone call when when someone shot and, and it happens virtually every night. So when you start talking about yeah. gun violence and, and gang violence, I, I kind of I, I kind of piece them together. And, and I have a acronym that I use, and it's prevention, intervention, and apprehension. Now, unfortunately, the only one of those three that I mentioned that we can take the lead on is the apprehension. But even in taking the lead, we need the help of the community. But there has to be prevention mm -hmm. side of it, not prevention um, like burglar alarms, that, that kind of prevention. I, I'm talking about true prevention where we're sitting down with our kids and we're affording them opportunities mm -hmm. so that they have hope. I can tell you one of the most frustrating things about these shootings that are occurring now is we got folks getting shot. They will bypass calling 911. They'll go to another city to avoid law enforcement, um, which makes our job incredibly difficult. Um, we, we got folks who will, will not tell us where they got shot. They won't even uh, tell us where it happened. So maybe our investigation can lead us to the shooter. It's that kind of hopelessness we're seeing in the community um, that we need help on that side of it. Then the intervention uh, piece is that there are folks who go out here and they make mistakes. Yeah. You have to find a way to be able to bring those folks in after they make the mistake so that we can help them become productive citizens. Mm -hmm. So the, the, whether it's the prevention and the intervention, the police department can play a support role, but mm -hmm. we can't take that on as well as the enforcement and apprehension of folks who are committing particularly violent crimes. Yeah, and this touches, I don't want to get too deep into, into the political waters here, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, what gets all the headlines is when a bunch of people get shot and killed, right? right? right. But I got to think, I mean, the just one-on-one -on -one crime, uh, you know, murders, gun violence is a whole lot. It, it's not this quote-unquote assault weapon. I mean, yeah, they're, in, in, again, we can talk what is an assault weapon, but, I, but the point I guess I want to make is that there's headlines that they get your attention. But in the everyday, how we go through life, you're much more apt to engage in that more of that one on one, I'm assuming. Right. But, right. Yeah. How do you, you know, how do you how do you knock some of that stuff down? You've talked some of that, but uh, I mean, you can't take all the guns away. How do, how do you try to limit uh, or do you? And, and let me, that gets let me into tie politics. Gloria, okay. let me tie yeah. Gloria's question into that, Randy. Right. And, and, and Gloria's question is based on, she, you know, um, you know, addressing black on black crime. And but she goes on and says, you know, how do we what are alternatives for what you have to do in context of maybe mental health? 
counseling, mentorship programs, you know, yeah. versus simply locking everybody up. And that all ties where you're going, Randy, with, you know, gun, uh, you know, gun violence. So, so very yeah. good question. And, and what I will tell you mm -hmm. is all of those things are occurring. So mentorship, um, not only police department, but, but several companies are, are out there and they encourage their employees to, to, to go out and, and do the mentorship. Um, I can tell you that the police department, I'm big into lost learning. So at least two things we're doing for lost learning during the summer for our kids is we have a city, youth citizens police academy where we, we brought in 22 kids and for a week, they learned all about the police department. We fed them uh, and, and kept them off the street for that week, but no, also got that noggin still yeah. working so that there's no lost learning. We're also in partnership with the police foundation we have a T-ball league and we're, it's probably about 80 kids. Mm, and then yeah. the Bell Park, this is our second year doing it. And it, they're being coached by police department, the police foundation bought all the equipment and that, and prior to last year, that field hadn't been utilized for 25 years Lordy, really? for, for T-ball. These, these are some of the things that, that we're doing, but, I, but what I would caution you that, None of those things can be the substitute for the the structure and discipline at home. Yeah, uh, yeah. and so we we you, it can be in lieu of it can it can work with, but it can't be in lieu of. And it's very, it, I think that's very important to know. What about so, hey, look, yeah? I'm, I got another one, Randy. I got yeah. another one. So I I would also believe in some way or another that your role as an assistant scoutmaster of the old Hickory Council Boy Scout Troop 912. By the way, I needed your help this weekend, dude, because I went camping <laughs> in a real tent with a real sleeping bag. Just so, He you did. Know, He's not lying either. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you're, I, I would wager, talk to me real quick <laughs> about your role there, as well as your role, this is, I, I believe, self-desired uh, role uh, as a, a, a mentor at Carver High School. Right, right. So, I, as a leader, you you got to do more than talk to talk. Now, yeah. I've been I, I've been working with the Boy Scouts for for about ten years now. I believe in the mission. I believe in in the messaging for the boys mm -hmm. and how to make them better citizens. So, I I would totally the the values, um, the scout oath, the scout law, all of those. If there is a person who walks in the police department who has those values, I'd hire them immediately. Um, that's how much I believe in. You can't do it anymore. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and, and the mentorship. So I I, I believe in that. Yeah. I, I'm glad I, I saw, it just popped up what Ms. Harrison asked about the intervention piece. So the police department mm -hmm. um, works with, the gang, with, with an intervention team. It's not a police, it's not the police department, nor should it be for the, for yeah. the, for the sake of credibility, yeah. but it does enlist different people in the community that mm -hmm. go in and they help people with the gang intervention. We have a close relationship with them, but it's not the police department. Some for some people, the moment they think it's the police department, it's a it, they shut down. Yeah. If anyone's interested in that, they can get with me on that. But we do. Cool. And along the same lines, I think Teddy, didn't you post the the, the uh, link to the police department's website? If somebody wanted more information yeah. about I don't know, employment or just add questions about yeah. how you I'm guys out. do what you do. I'm out on the employment stuff, the background check. I'm done. <laughs> I, was, I was afraid of that. All right. <clears throat> We've got about six minutes. Uh, we always ask a guest so just to kind of tee this up for a couple of minutes from now for one or two key takeaways. But before we do, uh, I'd like to, Teddy used to have a crystal ball. I don't know if it got repoed or not, but anyway, he had a crystal ball and maybe a magic wand. And if not, we'll use this. But if you had a crystal ball to look at it, what are some things you see coming down the pike from a policing standpoint, whether it's here in Winston or elsewhere? What are some things that are going to be kind of cool that might impact how you guys uh, continue to be effective? Right. So there, there's a T. Now, most police officers, we don't watch cop shows there. You know, we, we get tired of saying that's not for real, blah, blah, blah. But All right. I happened to be looking one day at a show, it's an FBI and CSI, yeah. and what it, what it does is it incorporates all these technologies, so something happens on the show, 
and you start seeing that technology in motion and it looks really, really cool. Um, I will tell the community, we're there. Uh, the Winston-Salem Police Department has that type of technology. What we need is more cameras. We need more participation. We have a, we have a um, video sharing um, program where we ask the community, hey, hey uh, register your camera and share them with us. Let me be clear, we cannot look at your camera, period. You have to give us access or send us the clip. Let me repeat that, we, we do not have access. A lot of businesses have partnered with us for very yeah. good reasons. They, they want the police department to be able to see any type of crime or anything that happens outside of their businesses. We don't ask for that kind of access to residents. However, if we would like to say, hey, there was a, there was a car broken into at 123 Main Street, I noticed you have a camera. Do you mind sharing your ring camera with us at between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m.? You can say, no, I'm not doing it. Or you can say, yes, here you go. Um, that's the type of, that's where we're going with this. What it does is we want to get violent mm -hmm. offenders off the street. We want them to know that we have so much access even before to be a deterrence as mm -hmm. well. So the folks say, ah, it's cameras everywhere in Winston-Salem. I got to go elsewhere. That's, yeah. that's the goal. I got you. Hey, uh, uh, one or two really quick takeaways. You got a couple, maybe one or, or so that you want to throw out there that if we heard nothing else today. We want to remember this. What you got? Yeah, we, we need yeah. we need the community. We we need you to see something. You say something. We 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 need you to lock up your guns. Yeah, we need you to walk away from conflict. Again. There are ways you can get involved without having the police come to your house. You can text a tip. You can utilize Crime Stoppers. We've done a poor job of explaining Crime Stoppers. When you call Crime Stoppers, you're nev you never give your name. You get a number. When you call back to, to find out the, case, the, the status of the information you gave, you give them your number. If it's a good case and you get paid, you get paid with your number. The only way somebody knows your number is if you say it. There's no names associated with it. Oftentimes we say Crime Stoppers Anonymous, people are like, I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. You've done a good job of explaining it. But you go by a number, never a name for Crime Stoppers. That's uh, from the, the African-Americans that I, I've spoken with. Uh, a distrust of police right. uh, is huge. Yes. And, um, you know, to be able to repair that is not an overnight thing. And and right. that just speaks to that. I, you say it's anonymous, but then again, you know, I knew so-and-so down the street that... Right. You know what I'm saying? And so that just breeds that lack of trust. So, uh, Chief William Penn, uh, when did you uh, get appointed uh, to your role as chief of police? When was that? January 30th, 2023. Wow. wow. So eight, eight, seven, eight months now. So uh, awesome, man. Well, so Randy, we can't yeah. say that this show has been the pinnacle of his career success. We, we can. We I'm may good, be lying man. through our teeth, but yeah, <laughs> you know, you've reached the pinnacle of your career less than a year into, into your new job. So, I'm Will, a I appreciate law enforcement official to be on this show. Okay. That's so, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a trailblazer. Yeah. Oh, good, man. We, we learned a lot of stuff and, you know, some things that, and Teddy, I'll, I'll throw it to you here in a second, just that I'll make up. We always have a little quick story and I'll, I'll make mine really, really quick is, is that you, just like a parent, parents can't be everywhere and, and police can't be everywhere. And you, you hope that you raise a, a child or, you know, that you have that influence. And something you mentioned earlier is you just never know what you may say or do and how that plays out in somebody's life, the influence that somebody has that mentor kind of thing. And so don't discount that. Don't think, well, I'm going to leave it to the cops. Uh, you don't have to be a cop. Maybe you see a kid in the neighborhood and you befriend them and, and you, you show them, you know, right from wrong. Uh, get off the, the bench, get in the game. All right, Teddy, I'll throw it to you. Will, thanks again for being on our show today. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, William, really appreciate it. Hey, I'll, I'll offer this that I've told my kids, and I'm happy to tell any, remind yeah. everybody this. In regards to law enforcement, there's two phone numbers you need in your cell phone. You need 911, pretty easy to do. Yeah. But you also need the phone number of your local police department in your phone. Because if you're like, I don't know if I should call 911. Call the other number 
Yeah. Have a quick chat and you may quickly find out that you probably did the right thing or you need to call 911. So, yep. But William, again, dude, thanks a lot for showing up. Really appreciate it. Uh, lots of cool stuff. If there's something that Randy and I or our show or our audience can do for you, uh, don't hesitate to reach back out to us. I will do my very best every time I walk into my city to, to be as good as I can be. And I know you expect that from me. So uh, <laughs> next week, um, oh, I got it right Tyler, here. Tyler, Tyler Worsma. I got to go find my notes for Tyler Worsma. <laughs> it's going to be on here. I can't figure out why I can't find my notes. So um, and Tyler's with uh, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. I think sounds good. Yeah. Um, I fa I apologize. I'm, I'm higher I'm education. We're gonna talk yeah. higher education. So yeah. uh, and yeah, you went to UNC gonna... Greensboro, didn't you? You said you went to UNC. G. Yes, that's where I got my bachelor's degree. Yes, I'm with you. Hey, we'll uh, we'll catch you guys next week, right? Uh, same time, same channel, right? Yeah. Eleven uh, fifty-five. I apologize, Randy. I fumbled. The conversation will be about higher education. Yep. With Tyler we uh, where's my from UNC Greensboro. And uh, it's going to be, is it something you should consider business school or not? So thank you everybody for showing up. William, take care. Thanks to our audience. Bye-bye. All right. See you now.